Um, I'm Barbara by now, and I think most of you know that, but I was once upon a time told you should always introduce yourself so people are like, who is that? Um, it is my pleasure to be one of the forum facilitators, um, along with my friends Kathy Heavers, Judy Ann Files, and Judy Benzinger. We're all here today. So if you're new to forum um, and you want to get on our email list, We've got some cards that'll tell you exactly how to do that. You just sign yourself up. And uh, if you have ideas for topics, come and talk to us. Um, we always like to hear your ideas. Thank you so much for coming to Forum this morning. Um, I am super excited to introduce um, John Crane. He is in charge of the cardiology unit at Montrose Regional Health. And he ensures me that he is gonna save all of our lives <laughs> with, with, with this information this morning, but it's it's always good information, and um, and I look forward to learning to learning something new this morning. So let's give him a, a warm welcome. Barbara, I didn't know this is going to be recorded, so I guess I have to be on the phone with you. So. Good morning. Well, my name is John Cray, and I am a nurse. And uh, let's start our show today. So. So who am I? And well, it all started a long time ago in a cat left far, far away. I was born in Texas, grew up in Maryland. Um, after I graduated high school, went to after I graduated from high school, went to Alabama, went to a military junior college, was commissioned in the Army. Uh, was in the Army for about three and a half years, was in the field artillery. I was on active duty right when Desert Shield turned into Desert Storm. Didn't go get deployed overseas. Um, but in the Army, what did we learn to do? We learned to kill people. And just going to say it, that's what it is, that's what we do. And after I got out of the Army, I had met my soon to be wife, who was going to, uh, we were in Louisiana, in Louisiana, I was at Fort Polk and Fort Hood and back and forth. Um, they had a really good nursing program at the school where she was. My wife's a school teacher. Uh, school starts tomorrow, no late list, so first graders, and grandkids and girls. Mrs. Crane is wonderful. She does a great job. Um, went to the nursing program, uh, graduated uh, as a nurse 25 years ago in June. Uh, and I started as an ICU nurse, and then I turned into a cath lab nurse. Uh, and truly became a cath lab nurse because I hated working in here the weekend. But there's more to it than that, and we'll get into that as part of the conversation. I've uh, been doing cath lab and cardiac related items since uh, Thanksgiving time of 1998. So next year will be 25 years for that too. Um, was in Louisiana, started as a nurse, became the charge nurse, became a manager, became a director, moved to South Carolina. Uh, after South Carolina, moved to Texas. I got tired of being a, a leadership person for a while and I became a travel nurse. You'll hear about travel nurses. Uh, I did that for about four and a half years. Uh, took the opportunity to, as a traveler, to learn multiple things from multiple places, and I took it as a test drive for places I was going. Went from little bitty places like Kingman, Arizona, was at the little bitty hospital there, all the way to Wake Forest, which is a thousand bed hospital, huge place, teaching institution, and I know I don't ever want to do that. Uh, got the leadership of uh, last travel, next to last travel assignment I did uh, was in Flagstaff, Arizona. Flagstaff is where I was before here. So that's John real quick. So, what we're we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about what is the cardiology service line and what do we do? Well, that's Dr. Lee. That's Dr. Foreman. That's Dr. Weathers. We're plumbers. And we're electricians. At a very high level, think about it. That's what we do. We take care of people's arteries that have a problem, it's a plumbing problem, or take care of people's problems that need a pacemaker, it's an electrical problem. So next time you see Dr. Lee, just imagine him bent over with him. No, no, maybe don't do that. Don't worry about that. Sorry, we got nauseous. But we're plumbers and we're electricians. That's what we do. There's about 50 people that report to me, and I'm the service line director for the, the hospital. So all of the cardiology folks report to me, and I in turn report to Jeff Mengenhausen, our CEO. So there's about 50 FTEs that work in this in this area. Uh, there's four interventional cardiologists and three nurse practitioners. So let's go back to what do we really do. There's different sections of what cardiology entails. The diagnostic side of cardiology is kind of a little bit, not as the, the cool and sexy things like the cath lab, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But this is where a lot of information can be gained to see what we need to do next. 
those screening items, this is what diagnostics card cardiology is all about. Your basic echocardio or uh, ECG, just seeing what your heart rhythm is doing, looking what the electrical uh, indicators on a, a squiggly line can indicate what your heart has done or may do in the future. Heart monitors, uh, cardiac event monitors, or Holter monitors. If you've ever had to wear a heart monitor for three days, that's a Holter monitor. If you ever had to wear one or know somebody that's had to wear one for a month, that's a cardiac event monitor. The cardiac event monitor is one that you wear for a long time. It's like, I heard somebody in here saying about, I felt like I was getting lightheaded. And I'm not saying that you need that, but when that does happen, if you're wearing your cardiac event monitor, you can push a button on it. It talks to a telephone and say, you know what, I felt lightheaded at 8.03 at the forum because I had the vision of Dr. Lee bent over with <laughs> that showing. And then the doctor, after he gets a report, can see, okay, well, your heart rate was going really fast, or it was going really slow, or it was just something else. That's what we do with these monitors and why we're wearing them. Treadmill st stress tests, so that's getting on the treadmill, getting the blood flow on, seeing how it affects your, your EKG and how it affects your breathing and how it affects your heart. Good old treadmill. And then tilt table studies. This is the world's most boring test. It's we put you on a table and stand you up, take your blood pressure before and after, and see what happens. Some, some young people, especially younger women, can have an issue with uh, hormones kind of as they're changing and after pregnancy uh, can affect how your blood transitions throughout your body and can lead to inappropriate changes in blood pressure based on if you're standing up or sitting down. That's what the tilt table can do. There's other reasons that we can do a tilt, but it's the world's most boring test until it's not. Either we just stand there and look at each other for about 25 minutes or you pass out. Next section, echocardiology, sonogram of your heart. This test takes about 15 or no, about 25 or 30 minutes. Uh, get you into a nice dark room. We have two great echo sonographers at our hospital that do the test of doing the echocardiograms. It's do the sonogram test to see how the chambers of your heart are shaped, how the valves are shaped, and how they work, and if they're competent or incompetent. That's an echocardiogram. Any questions about that? We had a bunch of y'all had that one before. If you do have questions, I got to pass the mic around. So sometimes it's easier to save them to the end, but if you want to do them as we go, I, I can do that. I can pass okay. the mic. Echocardiogram. And we do another one called the transesophageal echocardiogram. So a regular echocardiogram is done on the outside of your heart. You bring into the, to the room, have you take your shirt off, put the probe right on your chest, just like this. And then the technologist will do the work, checking and doing the, the measurements that we need to do, and move it around a little bit just to get the different angulations. And that gives a result for the doctor to, to make the read of what's going on with the test. Transesophageal echocardiogram is a little bit different. That one is so, now remember, your heart is behind your ribs, it's behind the lung. Can't necessarily see everything, especially some of the smaller and finer details. So the other test that we can do is called a transesophageal echocardiogram. That's taking that same probe that instead of putting it on your chest, now it goes down through your esophagus and we're looking at you from the inside. So it's going inside and looking at the heart from the inside, and we can get much finer definition and much better pictures to see what's going on. These are both day, day surgery kind of uh, echocardiograms. You just walk in and walk out. And the uh, transesophageal echocardiogram, if you come to the hospital and have one of those, you'll be there for know, two hours, maybe three. You get eight yards of paperwork to do with it, and that takes longer than the test itself. Whoops. Wow, that was cool. <laughs> nice. Let's go back to where we want to get to that nuclear slide, please. I didn't think I pushed it that hard. <laughs> you know, it, it can be a little pressy that way, I think. <coughs> All right, I go now. Yeah. Nuclear cardiology. Nuclear cardiology is very truly. Physicists, physicists and crazy, the rocket science kind of stuff. That's what nuclear cardiology is about. It's we're taking a, um, uh, a radioactive element called technetium and we inject it into your system and it gets into your heart and we can look at how well that perfuses throughout your heart. This left hand picture that looks like a donut, that's what we want it to look like. That's where it's lit up all the way around. So this means this is a good heart. This is a heart that's not so good because this section is not working. It's not, not showing up as much with the regulation. This particular test is one of those that's in multiple phases. 
We'll do a treadmill or we'll give you medicine to get your heart jazzed up and we'll do the injection. We'll see how your heart does under strain and then we'll see how your heart does under rest. And then we can compare the two. That's nuclear cardiology. Let's see if I can make this work this time. Now, the fun stuff, cath lab. This is when you hear somebody's having a heart attack or I had to get a stent or a balloon. That's what we're talking about here. And I've got some show and tell we'll talk about here a few minutes ago. I'm gonna set down my microphone here and give you a little bit of a quick anatomy lesson here. Left hand, make fists. <coughs> right hand, one, two, three, like you do in Germany. Mm. Over, your, over your hand, over your chest. That's your heart. Your second finger, that's called the left anterior descending artery. That's the main chamber, or the main artery, and the main chamber that supplies the blood flow to the left side of your heart. It's the most important one that we have. When you hear that term widowmaker, that's this one. Second one, your index finger, that's called your circumflex artery. That wraps around kind of back behind your heart and covers the front side and the middle back of your heart. And your thumb, now that looks like a letter C looking at me, that's your right coronary artery. That's the three main arteries that we have in our heart. Quiz time later. <laughs> How do we get from <clears throat> that, from us standing here to that picture? Well, there's a couple of ways to get there. You can go through the arteries in your wrist, usually the right hand side, but sometimes the left hand side. Or you can go through the arteries in your groin to get to your heart. And then the process that we do to take these pictures is really an exchange process all the time. We take a needle, we puncture the artery, put a wire in, and then we exchange things across that wire. Then we take special, te special shaped catheters, be it going through your wrist, to get all the way up around your shoulder, down to your heart, to take that picture of those arteries that we talked about. God made everybody a little bit different. That's one of the fun things about cardiology is it's always something new all the time. His anatomy is different than his anatomy is different than her anatomy and different than her anatomy. Most of those catheter placements and most of those wires that we use and most of the balloons and stents we use are bespoke. It matters your size. It matters your shape. So it takes a lot of um, equipment to make sure that we've got a size that fits all of y'all. Her arteries may be ginormous compared to mine, versus his might be small. We're all different, that's the fun thing. Your grandkids and your kids, if they can play video games, they can be an interventional cardiologist. <laughs> or a plumber. Because a lot of what we're doing is looking at a patient that is laying on a procedure table with an x-ray that moves around you and doing very small movements here to go to here to see there. So our doctor is standing here doing this, patient's here, and he's looking at a monitor to determine is there a problem with any of these arteries? These arteries here, they're in this picture, you don't want those. Those are not good looking arteries. Imagine a garden hose. That's a beautiful artery. We inject contrast or dye into the, into the artery after we've got the shape where we want it, and it fills up that garden hose with the contrast. We can see that on the x-ray. Garden hose is nice and smooth, right? So it's got a kink, or I step on it. Then you go from it was okay, to it's not okay. This picture patient, this is called the left main. This is that one that I told you goes on the front side of your heart, which you can barely see. This is not good. And this one actually goes behind your heart. That's those two that we talked about here. If I had another picture, we'd see the other artery and make like the letter C. And it covers the whole heart. How do we get there? Those wires I talked about, very flimsy tips, very small. This is one that we would use when we start the procedure. And that's pretty big. These are not bloody, these are okay to touch. <laughs> now imagine that we're going to put something into your coronary anatomy that's a 
a wire that's 14 one thousandths of an inch in diameter. This is the sharp end of it, but it still flexes a little bit. So we take this wire and we put it into that artery. I'll let you hold it. We'll feed that wire down the anatomy, and then we can exchange things over that wire. So you've heard about stents and balloons? That's how that works. Stents are metal scaffolds that are crimped down onto a balloon. That blockage that we need to fix, and we don't fix anything unless it's at least 70%. So anything that's above 70%, that's something that we would fix. We take that spot where the garden hose is crimped off, where the wire already is, and then we exchange a balloon across it, inflate the balloon, and the balloon does this, pushes everything out of the way, and you should feel better, but if we just do the balloon, something that can happen is it just bounces right back. So a stent helps prevent that. I told you, it's a wire mesh. Imagine the spring on the inside of your picked pin. That's the size of most anatomy that we're talking about. Small. There are several stents in this test tube here I'll show. Please hand it around. And again, we're all made different, so we've got to have all these different sizes available. That metal scaffold, when the balloon goes up, now expands and does this and holds it open. You've heard the term drug eluding stent. The drug eluding stent, you may have not heard it. When we first started in the cath lab a long time ago, we had to put our own stents on the balloon. And they were just a, a, a chicken wire, essentially. Just a chicken wire crimped onto a, a balloon that we would put into place and it would hold things open and smoosh it apart. What happens if you cut your hand? What's the first thing that your body does? Then what? Do what? Injury. That's correct. There's an injury, so what do we do? We try to fix it. We scar. Before we had drug eluding stents, and we put that mesh in place and pushed it open, the body's like, hey, that's an injury. I gotta fix that. Just like you nick your finger or you nick your face when you're shaving. I gotta fix that. So it makes a scar. And it would close back down because it would scar over that area that was worked on. Drug eluding stent slow that process down. We still want that wire mesh to get covered up because we don't want to have too much turbulence as the blood flows past to activate the platelets to make bad things happen. So the drug eluding stents slow down that process of scarring. How many of y'all have ever been to the cath lab as a patient? How many of y'all got stents? Took blood thinners for a while, didn't you? And you may still be taking them. It's an important thing because when we get in there, when we put metal in place, it's a foreign object. The body's got to get used to it. It has to endothelialize over it, the sexy term for it, to make sure it doesn't scar inappropriately. That's why those blood thinners are so important. That's the fun stuff that we get to do in the cat club. We get to take somebody, uh, I, I do administrative work most of the time, but yesterday we were quite busy. We had some people on vacation, so I got to go touch patients again yesterday, and I really had a good time. Um, I'd much rather do that than worry about spreadsheets sometimes. We had uh, three outpatients and one emergent, one urgent slash emergent patient yesterday. Our three outpatients, all of them kind of had a similar kind of story. Went to the doctor, had those tests that we talked about, the echocardiogram, the nuclear scan, there was something that was going on. We think that there's a problem, we want to look. This is the gold standard, those pictures of that anatomy that we talked about. That nuclear scan that showed the donut that had the bite out of it, that may have been territory where one of those particular arteries was showing, but it may not have been. The angiography pictures, those pictures of the arteries, that's the gold standard to know, is there a blockage going on? Three folks went home yesterday. Came to the hospital quick. Oh, I don't know what's going on. And I don't feel too great. I've had breathing issues. But you know what? Three yesterday I got told your artery is perfectly fine. 
clears a lot up here and makes life a lot easier. Another one needed some work done. So there were some stents that happened yesterday. And we do that all of the time, every day. We are an institution that has a STEMI program. And that stands for ST Elevation Myocardial Infarction. It's a real fancy way to say heart attack patients. If somebody does the fallout, take a Louisiana term. Does the DFO? Done fell out. Does the DFO at Walmart and they're having a heart problem? We'll talk about that, what you guys can do to help with those when you see that happen or if you see it happen. Walmart, ambulance shows up, says we've got a heart attack patient. We get called. Dr. Lee, Dr. Weathers, Dr. Wilkins. No, not Wilkins now. Dr. Foreman. Get called. Before they even leave Walmart, we can get called to come to the cath lab to be ready for that patient to show up and need some work to get done. So I talked about the outpatients yesterday. That's easy, came in schedule. We have somebody that's supposed to be there at nine o'clock, we're a little bit delayed, they went at 9.30, and then 10.30, and then 11.30. And it was like clockwork. But we made a difference. We really make a difference when you see one of these arteries on that previous picture is all the way closed. That's a heart attack. That's, oh my God, we're killing part of the heart. The heart is suffering. We do this, and it goes from, you're trying to die in front of me as my patient, so now we're laughing and talking about what are you doing for vacation next week? Well, literally, seeing and knowing a difference that that was closed, and now it's open. That's the cat lab side of things. A little bit more show and tell. So those wires we talked about, these are two different sets of catheters. These, this one is a balloon. You can see this very, very small section here. So we've got to go from either your wrist to your heart. How do you get there? I have long devices. And I'm only five foot nine. Imagine somebody that's six foot nine. Again, having that, got to have different sizes for different folks. A tall gentleman back here, we've got to worry about him. <laughs> and our shortest little ladies in the house, we've got to worry about you guys too. That balloon is crimped down on this. This one has a stent on it still. We're talking very small items going into very delicate work. Yep, there's a stent on the end of that. So the artery size that we're talking about for most people ranges from about two millimeters in diameter <laughs> upwards to about four, maybe four and a half millimeters. That's not very big. So again, grandkids play those video games. All right, let's see what we got next. Pacemakers, now the electrician side of things. Let me back up a little bit. Those uh, heart attack patients, let's talk just a little bit of volumes. I'm not going to bore you with as or even numbers, but I'll give you a little bit. Those patients that end up going to the cath lab and have procedures done, we do about 370 of those a year, and about 165, 170, maybe 180, just depends year over year, get stents or balloons. And we do about two or three of those heart attack patients a month. We always have three people that are on call along with a cardiologist 24 seven to be able to do that every day of the year. <coughs> Should something in our area need it. And we're covering all the way to Gunnison, Delta and Southward, down to Telluride, over to the West End, pretty big area. People that start off in Gunnison or out in Natarita, it takes them a while to get here and they can be really, really sick when they and they'd be really, really sick if they had a problem at Walmart, too. Electrician side of things, pacemakers. So you've got an inappropriate heart rate that's going too slow or going too fast. We can put in a pacemaker. It's got a brain box that lives under your skin, usually on the left-hand side. And if you're left-handed or shoot a gun left-handed, we'll put it on the right-hand side. Most times it's on the left side of your chest, just like you see in this picture. And these wires go through the vein system over to the side of your heart, one to the bottom of your heart. And one to the top of your heart. Remember back to Love Dove days, back a long time ago? How's your heart beat? Should squeeze at the top and then squeeze at the bottom. That's your Love Dove. Love Dove. Sometimes we get an inappropriateness where that love is going way too fast. That's atrial fibrillation. Or we 
have a situation where the top and the bottom of the heart are not talking together. So this side's doing what it wants to do. This side's thinking about doing what it wants to do. And they're not coordinated. Your heart works much, much better and much more effective when the top of your heart talks to the bottom of your heart. It's good, I didn't bring this up at that time. Pacemakers help resolve that problem. We're kind of taking over and saying, all right, the top of your heart's gonna fire here because we're hitting it with a little bit of electricity and then the bottom of your heart is responding when we tell it to respond next. Or your pacemaker can be there kind of waiting, saying, you know what? I'm just gonna stand here and watch. Everything's going fine. Oh, wait a minute, they're going too slow, let me help you. And that's what a pacemaker does. Keeps that rhythm in check, keeps that rhythm going the way that it's supposed to go. Another one that we've talked about, that we hadn't talked about, is called an implantable cardiac defibrillator, or an ICD. If you had a truly inappropriate rhythm that can happen on the bottom of your heart, it can take, o take over and go kind of out of, truly out of whack and go crazy. That's a heart attack that we talked about. And that happened because either I didn't get blood flow or there's a rhythm problem or electrical problem that we need to find out what it is. How do we fix that? Shock it with electricity. So you see on television when they shock somebody with the paddles, that's what an implantable cardiac defibrillator does. It's got a lead that zaps the electricity from this part of the heart to this side of the heart to do a bam. And then the heart says, what was that? And then restarts. And usually when that restart happens, it says, oh, it's supposed to be loved up, top to bottom, top to bottom, where the pacemaker kicks in. <coughs> Plumbers and electricians, that's what we do. Now some of the things that we don't do, I'll talk about, is for the electrician work that we do here, we do kind of the run of the mill pacemaker action. We will replace implantable cardiac defibrillators. But we don't do ablations. So where I talked about that top, bottom, top, bottom, for those things to happen, electricity has to happen. And sometimes you can have a short circuit where the electricity starts at the top and goes to the bottom, and then it starts chasing itself instead of resetting. What an electrophysiologist does is figures out where that inappropriate circuit is and then cuts it. Hopefully maintaining the rest of the circuitry. The way that they cut that is either with heat or with cold and radio frequency waves to burn that area and cut that short circuit. So bombers, electricians. I read electricians. Another thing that we don't do here in Montrose, at least not yet, is open heart surgery. Currently, if you need to have open heart surgery, you're either going to go up to Grand Junction or go over to the front slope or the west, um, front range. We have very strong relationships with both places, so depending upon what you need, we can have valve surgery, we can have bypass surgery. It kind of makes a difference. There's relationships between the providers there and the providers here. We have a good rapport with both sets. So if you need to have open heart surgery, going to either of those places is going to get a very good result. We don't do that yet. Yet. Now, not that we may not do that in three to five years. The population grows. We're kind of on that cusp of should we or shouldn't we? Should we or shouldn't we? Not quite there yet. But we're going to get there. So then we'll have even more services here in the community <coughs> for us. That's the hospital-based stuff that we had done, talked about, or that we had, all those items that we talked about. Now let's talk about the cardiology clinic. So over by the drive-in on Scar Court, that's where you go to see your heart doctor, that's where Dr. Lee's office is. So we have Foreman Lee and Weathers there, that's at the, over at the Star Court location. Dr. Wilkins is also now, three days a week, every week, at Gunnison Valley Hospital. So we've got him helping take care of patients in our whole region. We're looking to do this as a regional mentality. Montrose Regional Health, that kind of makes sense. OBGYN stuff done here, done in Delta. And that regional mentality and for cardiology we need to. And Dr. Wilkins is over at Gunnison. And then the support staff that work with each of these folks. That goes back to that about 50 people that we talked about overall. In the hospital there's about 17 or 18 of us. Uh, and at the cardiology clinic there's about 18, not counting the doctors and the nurse practitioners. And then our other area that we have is cardiac and pulmonary rehab. So that fellow that I talked about that had the DFO at Walmart, came to the hospital, got a stent, 
had some damage to his heart. Oh my God, I'm going to die again because it happened last Tuesday. What am I going to do to help make this better? Well, we've got this program called cardiac rehab. It's not just about exercise and cardiac rehab. Exercise is important. We want to make sure that you appropriately do the right things. We all know the stuff that we're supposed to do. Eat right, don't smoke, take care of your diabetes if you got it, don't drink too much, and exercise. This is a big program that helps with that. But it also helps with the space between the earlobes. Talking about those and being around other people that have had the same issue. There's a very good camaraderie that develops over the 30 some sessions that people can come to to realize, you know what? I can get over this. I can get better, I can get stronger. And you know, when I started, I can only do this for about five minutes and at this particular rate. Now I'm making a difference. Now I can go seven and a half minutes. And you know what? I can go for almost twice as fast. And my partner over there, look at that. She had the same kind of problem I did about two weeks later. She's getting so much better too. Cardiac and pulmonary rehab do those same things. It helps with the physical part of doing the work, but also the mental part of how we can get over this and get back to work if necessary, if it's that part of your life that needs to be doing those things. The vet's kind of a guy at Walmart, came to the hospital, we fixed him, went back to the doctor's office, cardiac rehab, back to work. Now, just those maintenance folks, and you get to come see the form. <laughs> Challenges for our area. We all know we're on the western slope of Colorado, 25, 27,000 people, whatever we have here nowadays. Finding folks that do this particular niche of work are not easy. And we're at that, that cusp of volume where I talked about the 300, almost 400 heart cats a year, and about 200, just keep the numbers easy, 200 intervention patients. It's hard to teach that when you're not doing seven or eight a day. I need that repetition. I have a new, new cath lab nurse that's starting today. A very strong um, ICU background. So he knows his medicine. He knows how to take care of somebody that's sick and trying to die in front of him. But all that equipment that we talked about, all the anatomy we talked about, all that breadth of all those departments that we talked about, being able to teach somebody how to do that takes a lot of time. And again, we do some things that are infrequent. And when those infrequent things that are high risk, that's a real big problem. Frank, the fellow that's starting today, will probably be in orientation for probably six months, at least. It'll take that amount of time to get somebody from walking in the department for the very first time, it's motivated, got a good core background, but it's gonna take a long period of time to get them to do that. Not very often you got somebody that's from 25 years of experience have been to nine different cath labs that want to come to the Western Slope of Colorado. I did. That doesn't happen every day of the week. That's the problem that we have is getting people that are appropriately trained to do this very high technical amount of work. It's no different than trying to find an operating room nurse. It's no different than trying to find a, an ICU nurse that has a lot of training. We have to help build our own. And in cardiology, it's a little bit harder just because there's so much stuff that we have to learn and do. And it's a hard job. Frank, the fellow that we talked about, has made a decision that he wants to come be a cath lab nurse. And that's pretty darn sexy and fun, and we're going to make a difference. But the other thing that Frank decided was that about a third or 40% of my life, I'm going to be on call. And on call means I got to be within 30 minutes of this building every day when it's my day to be on call. That's a tough commitment. That work life balance we all talk about. So not only is it hard to get people to come here to train, but to do that is not easy. Get my microphone out. Push button here. I almost said uh, Siri, next slide, but that can't be working. <laughs> All right, so that's the cardiology program in a quick 34 minutes. You see that guy at Walmart I talked about doing the DFO, done fell out. What do you do? Well, I'll tell you what most young people are going to do. They're going to do this. <laughs> oh, I got something to put on Snapchat. Cool. <laughs> Wrong. Please don't do that. Hey, 
are you all right? You don't look like you're breathing. You're not breathing. This is your job. Call somebody, or even better, tell her to call 911. Because what do you do next with this patient that's not breathing and doesn't have a heart rhythm? CPR. I had the opportunity to almost do CPR once in public. Some was about this big, we were at the grocery store. And I heard it, we were kind of over by the, I think we were kind of in the cereal area, kind of near the milk and the dairy. I looked over and around the corner, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a nurse, I gotta go help. Go around the corner, young, younger lady falling down. And she fell into the cheese. Cut her here, pretty good. I'm like, okay, are you breathing? Are you breathing, are you breathing? You, she was breathing. And I looked at the store employee, you go get the AED and call the ambulance. So that's, please, the, job, the two jobs that I want you guys to learn. If you've never done CPR, we have community-based stuff we can teach you. It's call for help and start CPR. That will save lives. And the third step I'd like you to remember is get the AED, the Automated External Defibrillator. So 911, CPR, AED. I bet there's one in this building somewhere. I know there's one at Walmart. Tell the employee, go get the AED after you call 911. And when you bring the AED back, it's a little box that looks like this. Open it up and turn it on, it tells you what to do. It's that easy. It's got diagrams. It's got pictures. It talks to you like Siri talks to you. Puts the patches on. Push the analyze button. Push the shock button. It tells you what to do. And please, if you got somebody that's doing this, they got a phone in their hand, tell them to call 911, not to take the crazy video. Call 911. Start CPR, get the AED. And you know what? If they're truly not breathing and they don't have a pulse, you're not making it worse. You're not gonna kill them because they're already dead. All you're gonna do is help and make it better. Please do. 911, CPR, AED. Then the cool people show up and the ambulance folks, we bring you the cath lab and we fix that artery. That's three minutes of that. That's the most important three minutes that I had for y'all today. Any questions on any of that? Thank you. I'm not done yet. Okay. Oh, wait. There's more. I'm going to tell a story. This is John's personal story. And I wrote this down because I've given this a couple of times and I don't want to miss anything. So I'm going to read to you just a little bit and I'll tell the story. And this is how I'm going to close. I was a traveler in Denton, Texas. This is about 10 years ago now. I was a travel nurse at Texas Health Resource Hospital in Denton, Texas, and I'd probably been there for two or three months. I did like it there. It was only a couple hours away from my home. So I traveled to the Dallas area to home in the Texarkana area. It was late spring or early summer, and my wife and I had gone to Sam's, making that Sam's run. I distinctly remember the day. It was beautiful, spring, uh, uh, sunny, late morning. We parked the car and Mary had forgotten something in the car. She turned around and going back to the car and I kind of walked over to one of those, you know, the big yellow bollards that they have. And I just kind of stand there, leaning there. And um, leaning against one of them, I turned around and gazed over the parking lot. It's like I'm gazing over you guys here. It was pretty busy, just a typical weekend day. It was a Saturday. So I'm standing there enjoying the sunshine. I noticed a gentleman to my left over there, kind of where Barbara's sitting. Uh, he had two kids in tow with him, and the dad turned his head in my direction, just glanced my way, and the youngsters, he had two youngsters uh, with him, they veered towards me. And a little tidbit that you guys didn't know about me, that I'm going to share now. I used to have long hair. <laughs> It's pretty long. You can see it's pretty long, and I put that left, uh, right hand picture up there. Um, the guy that's coming towards.
towards me. I caught his eye, he caught mine. I kept walking towards me. Uh, and then he reached his hand up to me and said, huh, I remember you. You may or may not remember me. And I said, hey, nice to meet you, how are you? And he continued, I recognize you as I was walking in. I just wanted to come over and say thank you. The gears in my brain were spinning. Who is this guy? He then said, you helped save my life a couple of weeks ago. I recognize you from the long hair, and now that I've talked to you a little bit, I know it's you. He went on telling the story of a couple of weeks ago, I was, one of, I was one of the staff as a nurse to help taking care of him in the hospital when he was getting treatment for a heart attack. He was very grateful. I was quite embarrassed, to be actually honest. I'm sure I was blushing a little bit. Continuing, he said, I knew it was you by your long hair. Now I know it for sure. I will never forget your voice. I'm so thankful for what you and the rest of the team did. I got goosebumps again. I'll, I'm so thankful for what you and the rest of the team did for me that night when I was having my heart attack. Then it even got more personal. He turned to his boy on the one side and said, introduced him. What about first grader? On the other side, third or fourth grader. He said, this man helped save my life. I wanted you to meet him. I shook the kid's hand and said, I'm so happy to see you again, and I'm very glad that you're doing better. It's very nice to see you again and meet your son. I didn't know what else to say. About that time, my wife comes strolling up. She retrieved the item that was left in the car. And I was a little dumbfounded and extremely proud to have met this gentleman again. This time he was upright, he was fully clothed, and he wasn't trying to die in front of me. He shared his family with me and made me part of him, just like he's still part of me. That's why we do what we do in cardiology. We get to make a difference each and every day, every time. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we do have time for questions. Um, we usually try and keep it to just questions, but my guess is some of you today might want to share an experience or thank the hospital if you have a personal experience. So I think I'll make an exception to our normal rule. So let's do some questions. I have a question about the ethics of CPR. When I learned CPR, well, if a person needs CPR, basically you're dead. The decision to do CPR, not do CPR, how far away are medical people? When do you quit if you do start? If you do start, um, there are um, there's laws in place that make sure that in the good faith that you're doing to try to help somebody, you're trying to help somebody. They are truly dead in front of you. If you're trying to help them, you're doing the right thing. You're not going to get sued if you break their ribs. You're not going to get sued because you save their life. You're doing the right thing. When do you stop? So I called for 911 and we're in the middle of nowhere. Don't stop until you can't physically do it anymore. If you can't physically do it anymore, you did the best that you could. Yes, sir. Good Samaritan laws, that's the word I was trying to think of. What about skip beats? What Funky beats, beats, FLBs, funny little beats. Yes. Yeah, so what about skip beats? I have them. We probably all have them. It's just a matter of when that electricity begins, becomes inappropriate. And that's where we have those tests that we talked about, about wearing the ultra monitor or that cardiac event monitor. You can put it here, those funny little beats, and they happen either the skip beat can turn into a stretch of skipping. It can turn into electricity that, that, that degrades over time. That can get bad. Mine's caffeine related. I know what my problem is. I haven't had caffeine in 20 years. But you don't know that until you get your test done and you don't see your doctor. So if you do have those funny little beats, or I get lightheaded, or, man, my heart is racing. Man, I just broke into a sweat. I think I better sit down. That's something that should get checked. Those occasional little, oh, that was a little funny little thing. If it's just once in a while, not that big a deal. But there's some rhythm 
or some cadence to how often that happens. You know, after I drink coffee, it happens all the time. I'll make stuff drink coffee, but also probably get a check. Sir. With uh, a family history of cardiac issues, would you recommend to say, in my case, my children in the 40s be checked with a, without having symptoms? Preemptively checked, that's a really good question. Again, nurse. But I'll tell you the key things that we need to be thinking about, and I'll circle back to your question. There are things that we can do that we all need to do. I talked about this already. Eat right. If you're diabetic, keep that under control. Don't smoke. Exercise. Easy on the alcohol. We all know those things. If you've got a family history, can't do much about that. Other than those items we talked about. If you have a sibling that died when they were young, or your father or mother died when they were young because they had a heart attack, those are things that, you know what? If there's a strong family history and I'm 40, yeah, I'd get checked. But we all know those things we're supposed to worry about. You can't get away from genes, but we can control all those other things. If we're diabetic, get your sugars right, keep it right, exercise, eat right, don't drink too much, all those things that we know. One more in the back. One more in the back. I was just wondering, um, one of my concerns living in a rural area, and I mean, we got a good hospital here, but you already went through some of the things you do and don't do. What about other dire emergencies that are cardiovascular, whether it's uh, strokes, aneurysms, embolisms, those type of things that can kill you pretty quickly, but you may have to be flown somewhere, or maybe the hospital can't handle it, or you get transferred to another hospital and you lose time. Um, I just wanted to see what, if you think my concerns are warranted as I get older? To a degree, yes, and to a degree, no. Um, Bella and not Walmart, my, my one I keep going over as part of our example. Bella and Walmart comes to the hospital and needs to have open heart surgery. It's doing really, really bad. I can go from the second floor of the hospital to the fifth floor of the hospital, get in a helicopter, and be in St. Mary's in about 25 minutes. Is that 25 minutes? Yes. Having a stroke? Come to the hospital, you can get blood thinners, clot busters, just like you can do in Gunnison Valley for your heart, clot busters for your, uh, as long as it's not something that's a bleeding problem, more of a clot problem related to a stroke, clot busters can help with that. And if they don't work, again, it's a 20 minute helicopter flight somewhere. Part of the give and the take that we have of living somewhere, it's not remote, but it's far enough away that you have those considerations, that's for you to decide. Most of the time, we can fix things that are cardiac related on the spot. In the three years that I've been here, I can think of one instance in the three years that I've been here where we had to, oh my God, get in the elevator, go to the fifth floor and get out of Dodge now. Partly answered your question, so that's kind of a personal choice. You gotta decide, I wanna live somewhere that's beautiful or do I wanna live somewhere where there's a hospital in the corner down the street that can do everything under the sun. I think that we do a really good job and we have a really strong track record of doing good work. On the cardiac side, I would have my heart cath done here. I'd have my father have this done here. Um, but it's a personal choice, of course. Helicopter ride is not that far away. It's really fast. Uh, One I'm more coming, question? I'm coming, I'm coming up. This is a comment rather than a question. The cath lab that you have did an excellent job on the edge well as the EMS did uh, complete blockage to the major parts of the valve, I mean, the uh, artery, and uh, kept me alive. Thank you for sharing. Glad to have been part of, the, part of the overall team that helped take care of you. Yeah. And you got to have it done right here. And we will be here every day until we're not. <laughs> so and Every I'm day we will be here ready take care of any of you or any of your family members. So if I may ask a follow-up question on that, since we went through that horrendous thing back in January and now this last week had the ablation, is that something where we should personally carry an AED with us? 
No, uh, your doc would have, um, if he, if he, I'm sure you're talking about him, yep, if he needed to have something, I think we've already talked about doing that defibrillator or having wear an external vest, they would have covered those items. But I'll tell you one thing that I do want you to know if you're doing our bill already, is go to the CPR club. To be really honest, the morning that he had this semi-heart attack, we didn't notice what was happening. He had no pain, he just laid down on the floor. Yep, and that's one thing I didn't cover, is we're all different. Talking about all the different stages of sizes that God gave all of us. Women respond differently than men. Some men, I'll tell you what. Men are wusses when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I will deny I said that. <laughs> you women are much tougher. You guys have babies. Make sure you're not tougher about a whole lot of stuff. Men typically say, well, it's just heartburn. Well, it's just, well, it'll be all right. And women sometimes don't even really notice it just because you're so tough and strong. We're all different. If it ain't right and it doesn't, you don't think it's right, you get that little spidey sensation of where the hairs on the back of your neck are standing up, call 911. Get somebody to help you. We're all different. My heart attack pain may be completely different than his and completely different than hers. I can't give you, if it's your jaw pain, if it's your left arm, if it's your greater toe on your right foot, we're all different. So are you saying you're reluctant to say what it feels like because it just varies so much? Classical chest pain is gonna be arm, jaw, and neck. But some people have epigrastic pain and it feels like indigestion. Some people have back pain. Classical chest pain is arm pain, jaw, and neck. But not everybody's classical. So if you've got any of those classical things, obviously get help, get help fast. Back in the back room. So I wish I could say, whenever you have this, always call that. It's not quite that easy. So I had a triple bypass six years ago and uh, been doing well since, but I uh, was told that la that'll last about 10 years. That seemed like a long time then. <laughs> For true, absolutely. Now I'm wondering what my options are when the warranty goes out. Well, when you hit your 100,000 miles, make sure you're doing your doctor checkups like you normally would, and we will do some of these other testings to make sure that those, are, those bypassed arteries, so going back to our little heart here, what he's talking about the bypass is we've connected up to the aorta, and we've bypassed with a another blood vessel to go down here. Instead of fixing this because it's closed, we just went from here to here. That's a bypass. He's got three. I hope he's still got three. I mean, all, all three of them may last until you're 95. I don't know how old you are now. Or they may only last for another week. Cool. That doing the right thing, keeping your blood pressure, taking your medicine, eating right, exercise, all those things that we know that we're supposed to do, keeping your blood sugar right and keeping your appointments is the key thing. Everybody is different. That's the fun thing about what we do with cardiology. That's what our electricians and plumbers are expert at is looking at not just what the classical is, but the exceptions. Hopefully, I won't get to see you in the cath lab anytime soon, but we're here if we need to. Thank you. You betcha. I'm coming up to that front All right. Right. If you have a pacemaker and um, you have low problems and they suggest a stress test. A stress test is different with a pacemaker. Absolutely. It's like dying. Uh-huh. And a lot of times we can, give, we can give medicines to help do that too. Instead of having to get on a treadmill and hoof it as fast or as long as you can, we can give other medicines that can help jazz up your heart. Kind of a... Um, and that's what I'm talking yep. about. That's yep. murder. <laughs> For that little bit of time. <laughs> For that little bit of time when we're doing the test. And what do you find out? It could tell us if there's a, a circulation issues. If the blood is per, it's a perfusion test. Is the blood perfusing to the heart where it needs to be going consistently? That's what the test is helping you show with that nuclear scan. Is do you have areas that are getting underfed with blood or areas that are appropriately getting fed with blood? So for you, not getting on a treadmill or having the pacemaker doesn't really make a difference. But we give you that liquid adrenaline injection, and it's very lame and firm there, to jazz up your heart for that three or four minutes. It may feel like crap. I won't deny that. 
but it allows us to get a really good test and see how things are going or not going. Okay. And some people are very sensitive to it. Some people it doesn't really affect at all, and it sounds like you've been pretty sensitive to it. And I apologize for that. But that's the way God made you. It's a couple of minutes. But you don't know if you really need that. It, it just... See your doctor. Trust who you see. They're going to do the right thing. First of all, I want to thank you for coming to the Western Slope. Uh, I know it's a big commitment, and uh, um, try to get more doctors. You can convince them how wonderful it is. We can find them a nice place within 30 minutes. Yeah, and um, and you survived having mom here in Texas. Yes, I did. Yeah, you're a tough guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, do they, question is, do they um, stage an AED in usual places in the same place? in stores and, and when you're out and about, are they supposed to be in one kind of main area or are they are just wherever they show? I don't know if there's this particular place that they always put them in the left front of the store. I wish that we would get to that point, but I don't think that we do. Um, usually if you find an employee. They've been trained. Yep, they, they've been trained. They, we do, uh, at the hospital we do, um, even in common areas. We had somebody that fell down the steps. We've been, for those of you who've been to the hospital, going up to admission, we had somebody that fell down the steps. They passed out. So there are two different AEDs. One at the top of the stairs around the corner. There's one right by the elevator at the coffee shop. I know what that is because I see it and we train on it every. Uh, and we do mock code situations where um, I unfortunately, when I was working in Louisiana, where I told you where I started, we actually had an employee that was down in the bowels of the building. So I don't know, a five story building uh, with a sixth floor underground, pretty big, about three times as big as our hospital here. Um, he was down in the, in the bowels of the building. He passed out, nobody knew it, and he died. So that, that being, being able to recognize that there's a problem and make a change and make a decision and to help, I always still feel bad about what happened to him. It was the middle of the night and nobody was there. God said today was today. But you know what? If I make it to the Catholic or make it to EMS, I don't like to lose. We're going to do everything that we can to save the situation as best we can. And I don't like to lose, and I don't lose very often. That's a great, a great note to end on. Let's give John a big round of applause.